Hello YouTube and welcome to this video in the How to Be a Pilot series. Today we're looking at the night rating. As we're in the depth of the winter, a lot of pilots have to curtail the amount of their flying activities due to the lack of daytime or daylight hours. The solution to this? Well, to go and get a night rating. It is a fantastic way to expand your horizons and provides a chance to improve your flying skills across the board with some new challenges. Flying at night is a whole new experience. Countryside and locations that you know so well look different and make people fall in love with the allure of night flying. In this video, we'll cover three main topics. Firstly, the training requirements for the night rating, including the pre-entry necessities. Secondly, a review of the night rating training course itself. And finally, a few comments on flying at night. Now, as ever, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below and we'll get back to you. In Europe, night flying is not automatically included in the PPL syllabus, unlike the FA or the American system, and thus an additional rating is required. However, once this rating is obtained, it is valid across all the helicopter types you have in your license site. If you fly the Robinson 22, 44 and 66, you don't need to go and do a night rating on each type of aircraft. That said, just because you have a night rating, you also have to check that the helicopter is certified and fit to fly at the night, and it's not rated for day VFR, for example. As we'll cover later on, each country has its own quirks when it comes to flying at night, so double check that you and the aircraft are fit to fly before you take off. Now, before you can start the night rating, there are some preconditions that need to be met you must have accumulated 100 hours of flight time post the issuance of your helicopter license. Included in this 100 hours, there must be 60 hours of pilot and command time, 20 hours of cross-country flight, and then the course itself, the night rating, must be completed within a period of six months. Now, the requirements for the course itself, well, there's five hours of theoretical knowledge instruction that has to be done, and 10 hours of simulated instrument flying in the helicopter. Now that 10 hours is irrespective of any instrument instruction flight that you've already uh, locked previously. Now there are some reduction to the 10 hours. Five of the hours can be in the simulator, um, and if you previously have held, or currently held, uh, a fixing or a helicopter instrument rating, then you can receive five hours of credit towards that simulated instrument time. The Flying side, though, itself consists of five hours of flying at night, which three hours have to be dual instruction, one hour has to be a cross-country navigation flight, and then there's five solo night circuits that have to be done. So all together, that equates to five hours of flying at night, and the course, as I mentioned, has to be completed within six months. So, for those five hours of ground theoretical knowledge, we actually cover quite a lot of topics, um, and uh, we, we'll go into them in more detail shortly, but just as an overview, um, we start off with defining what night is, what the rules are for flying at night, what airspace is available when, uh, when flying at night itself. Then we start to look um, at lighting, lighting inside the aircraft in terms of map lighting, cockpit lighting, but also um, to do with airfields, airfield lighting, obstructions, approach path lighting, precision approach path lighting, for example. Um, and then we look more about the, the actual pilot itself, the physiological uh, aspects of vision, night vision, and orientation or disorientation, as the case may be, how, um, how uh, that can be very, very dangerous at night, uh, and various types of disorientation and how to counter them. Then moving more on to the navigation side, um, practical navigation principles, um, navigating uh, using motorways, roads, large cities, for example, but also looking at radio navigation principles, how to use a VOR, uh, an NDB, or indeed a GPS set to assist you with navigating from A to B. As part of that, we then start to look at performance and planning, so safety altitudes, aircraft performance, dangers from icing conditions, uh, and escape maneuvers, uh, and also um, weather, uh, which is a huge part of flying at night. Then for the actual flying side itself, for the, for the air exercises, well, the first exercise is just basic uh, maneuvers, flying solely by reference to the instruments. Um, and flying at night is the closest that you'll get to flying on instruments without having an instrument rating. So that's what the, the reason for this additional qualification and the reason to practice instrument flying so much. 
Secondly, uh, a recap and a use of radio navigation instruments, uh, as we spoke about with the theoretical, how do we actually use these tools on the ground to help us locate where we are? Exercise three, explain and demonstrate uh, radar assistance. How can we use uh, air traffic control to, to help us um, navigate uh, along our way and what different services are available for us at, when we're flying at night? Exercise four is about demonstrating the, uh, the lights in the aircraft, how they can be adjusted, landing lights, cockpit lights, navigation lights, for example, and then night hovering and emergency procedures working the circuit. That leads up to exercise five, which is solo night circuits, and then exercise six, which is night cross country, so navigating at night. So first of all, what is night? Well, the UK Civil Aviation Authority defines official night as the time between 30 minutes after sunset and until 30 minutes before sunrise. After the introduction of the single European rules of the air and the official record series four, number 1125, we're allowed to fly VFR and special VFR at night in the United Kingdom. Now, to do this, we have to maintain a couple of different conditions. So any aircraft leaving the vicinity of an aerodrome must maintain two-way communication with air traffic control and file a flight plan. Now, filing a flight plan, you can still do this over the radio as an abbreviated flight plan, or commonly uh, at airfields, you can book out. There's also some more restrictive weather minima. So the minimum cloud ceiling when flying VFR at night is 1,500 feet above mean sea level and the flight visibility must be three kilometers for a helicopter flying outside controlled airspace. When we're below 3,000 feet, we must maintain sight of the surface, so similar to flying during the daytime. However, there is a minimum height of 1,000 feet above the highest fixed obstacle within eight kilometers of the aircraft, except when taking off and landing. Now, this increases to 2,000 feet if over high terrain. So really key things there, cloud ceiling of at least 1,500 feet, and we have to be 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle within eight kilometers. When we talk about lighting, we can split this into two parts, the aircraft lighting and then the lighting uh, around the airfield. Now even within the aircraft lighting section, we can actually split that again in two. So there's the external lights, so um, the navigation lights, any emergency lights, any pop-out uh, or pilot-controlled searchlights, for example. Uh, and making sure that we check those before flight. And then actually inside the cockpit, well, um, do you know how to adjust the brightness of the cockpit lights? Um, there may be uh, a pilot's light that's mounted on the top of the cabin. Can you change the brightness from, from bright to dim or indeed from white to red light? Similarly, on the instrument panel, do you know how to dim the, the lights as the, the night closes in? You want to bring the brightness down. Also, when we're flying at night, we should always uh, have a head torch. That's in the case of any lighting failure or even worse, electrical failure. So we can have that uh, head torch on uh, and we can still see the instruments, even though the lighting may have failed. It's always best to get a head torch that can adjust its brightness, but also that's got a red light filter on or to, to apply a red light filter by putting some red film over the top of it. For the aerodrome lights, we look at the different types of lighting that we can have. So what is the difference between a PAPI, an APAPI, or a VASI, for example? So uh, a PAPI, a Precision Approach Path Indicator light. These are four lights uh, installed either to the left or to the right of the runway um, that can either display red or white, depending if you're too high, too low, or indeed on a three degree, uh, it's standard three degree approach path. What you're looking for is two whites, two reds. That's a good news story. The VASI is similar, but it stacks um, the lights above or below. Um, so again, if you've got two reds, then you're too low. If you've got two whites, you're too high, and one set of reds, one set of whites is bang on. Uh, similarly to the uh, to the VASI, um, you have the APAPI, which is the abbreviated Precision Par Approach Path Indicator lights. Just a red and a light, uh, red and a white light. Um, two reds, too low, two whites, too high, and uh, uh, red and white is bang on. Now. 
as a helicopter, you're not always landing on the runway. And in fact, what we use quite a lot if we were landing off airfield is uh, it's commonly known as the NATO T. Now, this is a series of five lights that are spaced usually 10 meters apart, and they allow the pilot to, um, to judge distance and the approach path. We also do a quick bit of revision on aerodrome identification beacons. So for civilian airfields, the, uh, the beacon should be green, and, it should, and then for a government or a military uh, airfield, that would be a red beacon. We also have a look at the, the different types of runway lights in terms of centre line, uh, the end lights, and also taxiway lighting colours. This is also a good chance to brush up on your aircraft identification um, or indeed where the lights are on an aircraft. So the backlight it covers 170 degrees, that's a white light, and then the lights on either side, that's 110 degrees. Uh, on the right hand side, it's a green light, and on the red left hand side, it's a red light. Now, just a little bit on the physiological aspects of looking at night or vision at night. Uh, it can take about 30 minutes or more for your eyes to adapt to low light. Um, however, uh, 20 minutes in a dim red cockpit lighting will provide a degree of adaptation, which is again why we use red light when we're flying at night. Um, however, if you look at a white light, then the whole adaptation process might, must start again. So this is a good reason to pre-flight your aircraft during the day uh, and check all the, the lights during the day um, when you're not worried about uh, affecting your night vision. Now, altitude also degrades uh, your night vision because the eyes demand for oxygen increases as light dims. So if you're a smoker or you've inhaled some sort of carbon monoxide, your vision will deteriorate. And in fact, some, uh, some experts actually say that you should use oxygen for night flights above 5,000 feet. Um, so that's it for part one of our video on the night rating. Stay tuned for the second half and don't forget to subscribe if you want to keep up to date with everything AB Helicopters.